morning, and I want to welcome you to this marvelous um, uh, lecture that we have by Dr. Schelling. And indeed, it is an honor to introduce our Nobel laureate uh, to uh, the OSHA Lifelong Learning Series. Uh, Dr. Schelling um, is an American economist, and of course, uh, uh, among his many, many accomplishments, he was awarded the 2005 uh, Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences um, in the area of uh, game <coughs> theory analysis. In addition, of course, he has contributed through the years to our whole understanding of economic theory and his book, The Strategy of Conflict, is considered one of the hundred books that have been <coughs> most influential in the West since 1945. But today, we're here to listen to Dr. Schelling's thoughts concerning the all-consuming concern of global warming. Um, Dr. Schelling uh, chaired a commission for President Carter in 1980 uh, and has been working in this area uh, since then. Uh, and since you have come here to hear Dr. Schelling and not me, I will now turn the podium over to Dr. Schelling. Thank, Thank you. you. Don't worry, I'm not really a game theorist. <laughs> Climate change is a new subject. Uh, I was part of a study group in 1978 that produced a 600-page book with the title of Energy, the Next 20 Years. We had three pages on global warming and climate change out of 600 pages. I was also on a study group on nuclear energy, and we published our book on the future of nuclear energy in 1979. Out of 400 pages, we had four pages on the greenhouse problem. If anybody wrote a book about the future of nuclear energy today, a third of the book would be on nuclear weapons proliferation, a third of the book would be on how to dispose of nuclear waste, and a third of the book would be on the fact that nuclear reactors don't produce any greenhouse gases. So this is essentially a new subject, and the, the uh, scientific consensus, if there is one, continually changes. And, uh, and because it's a new subject, it's very full of uncertainty. You see, when I first got into this in 1979, there was no science of climate change. There were scientists concerned with different parts of the subject. There were atmospheric chemists and atmospheric physicists and agronomists and oceanographers and glaciologists, all of whom eventually became part of the study of climate change. But at the time, they didn't consider themselves climate scientists. They considered themselves whatever they were. The agronomist was concerned with the way things grow, and the marine biologist was concerned with life in the oceans and so forth. So it's a very new subject uh, and a very new, what you might call, scientific discipline. On the other hand, the basic science has been understood for more than 100 years. It's been known that lacking greenhouse gases, Mars is too cold for water to exist as a liquid. And it's been known that Venus, because it is smothered with greenhouse gases, is too hot for water to exist as a liquid. Earth, among all the planets of our solar system, has a temperature range that permits water to exist as a liquid, neither ice nor steam, and therefore Earth can support life. And the reason we have this climate is we've had a very nice density of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The two main greenhouse gases, at least until recently, have always been carbon dioxide, which is what you get when you burn wood or coal or oil or gas or anything like that. Uh, and uh, uh, water vapor. Half of the greenhouse gas that surrounds us now is 
nice old water vapor. Every now and then you hear carbon dioxide referred to as a pollutant. Even the Environmental Protection Agency, <coughs> responding to a, a suit brought against it that it should take carbon dioxide seriously, the EPA <coughs> referred to carbon dioxide as a pollutant. So did our president when he was running for office. Uh, remember, without carbon dioxide, there would be no life on Earth. Carbon dioxide not only governs our climate, and if there's too much carbon dioxide, we, we may begin to suffer. So carbon dioxide not only is responsible for a climate that is compatible with life, but it's also the substance without which there could be no vegetation. And if there's no vegetation, there's nothing to eat because even the, even the carnivores depend on vegetable eating prey. The, the, the problem is that we have stored carbon in the form of coal, oil, and gas for a few hundred million years. And when we pull that carbon out and burn it for energy, it produces carbon dioxide. And if there's too much carbon dioxide, then bad things can happen. Don't worry about breathing too much carbon dioxide. Actually, by the time we finish this hour in this room, we will have more than doubled the density of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere here. So uh, nobody's ever discovered <clears throat> that too much carbon dioxide is bad for pregnant women or small children or unhealthy people or anything. So carbon dioxide, I always think uh, too much carbon dioxide can be bad. But let me also say too much oxygen would be catastrophic. People talk about the possible doubling of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere doubled, every fire would be a conflagration. All the forests would have burned down by now, and probably most cities would have burned down by now. Uh, I remember when I was in ninth grade, uh, what happens if you double the concentration of oxygen in some kind of a flask, and you drop in something that is supposed to, like, like a candle, to burn, and the candle set vir virtually exploded because of the, the oxygen. So we're lucky because we've got a nice amount of oxygen and a nice amount of carbon dioxide. And the only difficulty is that it looks as if in the future of this century, we're going to have much too much carbon dioxide. And that's what the president was talking about in Pittsburgh. And that's what he's the U.S. delegation is going to talk about in Copenhagen in December is what can be done to reduce emissions of carbon dioxide so that the concentration in the atmosphere stays within reasonable limits. What is a reasonable limit? For some reason, an increase of global atmospheric temperature, surface atmospheric temperature of 2 degrees Celsius has become popular as the limit the temperature increase. That's uh, not a very useful thing. The, the uh, European Commission essentially settled on two degrees Celsius as the upper limit to a temperature increase. And you can now read in the morning newspaper that this is being sort of accepted. Um, first notice, two degrees is a very round number. If, if somebody were trying to be scientific about it, it might be 1.85 degrees or 2.2 <laughs> degrees or something of the sort. And I think 2 degrees is per year or per... It is 2 degree increase per year or per decade? Oh, well, it is generally expected that whatever temperature increase we achieve will be permanent. <coughs> Eventually, there may be ways to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but at present, those are considered possible. They're probably very expensive. So that the thought is that the temperature will rise and we should, by the time it gets to 2 degrees Celsius, above what they call pre-industrial level, uh, that's, we shouldn't let it go any farther.